Hello and welcome. I'm Patrick Curtis, your host and chief monkey, and this is the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Join me as I talk to some of the community's most successful and inspirational members to gain valuable insight into different career paths and life in general. Let's get to it. In this episode, Adam shares his long and winding road from investment banking at Goldman Sachs to medical school at UPenn, and then to joining the MD MBA program at Wharton. Learn why he ended up in McKinsey doing strategy consulting after one year of residency, and listen to the end for one big warning as you set out to map your career. Adam, thanks so much for joining the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Sure, happy to be here. So it'd be great if you could just give the listeners a short summary of your bio. Yep, so I'm a um, healthcare venture capital investor at uh, Avidity Health Capital. We invest in late stage um, med tech, so med device diagnostics and some digital health. Um, I'm a physician by training, and I guess, uh, you know, just starting from college, I was an economics major, so I guess you could say I came back full circle to the, uh, to the business world. Um, a- after college, worked on Wall Street briefly, um, and then uh, decided I wanted to go to medical school, and uh, did all the things you have to do to get into medical school, uh, ended up uh, pursuing a, a joint MD-MBA. Um, doing a bit of residency in emergency medicine, but I also sort of never lost that interest in the business side of things and healthcare systems and uh, ended up uh, kind of going to McKinsey after um, my, my intern year uh, of, of residency. Um, spent about four years there working across the value chain in healthcare, but uh, doing a lot of work actually with hospitals and health systems, and then, uh, and then moved over to the investing side about uh, almost five years ago. That's great. So back, let's go all the way back to undergrad. Sure. So what, a while ago now. A while ago. We graduated the same year I did, so I guess we're yeah. both old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of specific kind of game plan in undergrad, how much of a game plan was there kind of before you graduated? Were you thinking, I want to go finance for sure? Was medicine on the horizon? So, hey, I'm having some technical difficulties. I can't hear you. I didn't hear okay. your last question. Can you hear me now? No? Let me see here. Sure. Yeah, so I never thought in medical school ever, or sorry, in college seriously about medical school. Um, I don't have physicians in the family. I guess I grew up around some, some in the neighborhood, but mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I figured I'd kind of work in, um, I sort of prepared myself for a career in finance. I, I'd worked internships um, in the finance department of a large company. Um, before my senior year, I did a, a, a investment banking internship and then took that offer and, and joined after college. So that, that, you know, I didn't know long-term if I would be in that world, but I figured at least as sort of the initial path after college, I would be doing the Wall Street thing. You know, I, I graduated, a, a, it was an interesting time. My, my summer was still sort of at the high point in summer 2000, uh, not quite summer 99, but summer 2000. And then uh, uh, going back in, in, in summer and fall of 2001, obviously was a, uh, you know, an interesting time to say the least, uh, you know, a challenging time uh, to be, to be working down, downtown. So um, I think that, was part of you know what may have changed my uh, my, my path a bit. So tell me a little bit about. So I graduated in '02. You were '01, right? That's right. Class of '01. So I remember when I was recruiting, um, right after 9/11, it was almost like just everything went frozen and silent, and just obviously recruiting just like fell off yeah. a cliff. You were kind of had already hit the desk, right? Or you were. That's right. I um I had um actually was was staffed already on september 11th because I, I had been a summer, yeah, where, so. where were you working in midtown or downtown no, i was downtown right. yes. uh, down in, on, on you know on broad street um on more of the east eastern tip so um i you know i was i was working and and the recruiting so it was a normal recruiting class basically for my year yeah. um, and, and we were the cheap labor so to speak <laughs> so uh you know although things changed and i think offers you know that, that was, those were the era 
guess a lot of Wall Street offers getting rescinded, you know, we were the relatively cheap labor as the, as the analysts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and look, I, I, I like, I thought I enjoyed what I was doing, um, you know, in terms of the responsibility, in terms of um, the camaraderie, the, 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 you know, my, the, the, my colleagues, both, you know, my peers as well as the, the senior folks, you know, I actually enjoyed all of that. I think for me, it just, I wanted something more tangible. Um, and, and, and that's how I kind of came upon medicine, but it was, it was an odd time. I mean, you know, it was, it, you're, you're right. I think that, you know, they kind of right size it the following year, but it took them some time to, to do that. And so it was an odd time to be on Wall Street. And so you're there for about a year and then you kind of felt like you wanted to do something else, but it's a big, it's a long path. Medicine's a yeah. long path. It's a big <laughs> commitment. And so for other people in banking, they're considering going and getting their MD. Is it something you look back and you say, wow, I'm really happy I went and put all those years in <laughs> and suffered through med school and MCATs and doing all that hard work? Do you feel like it's, it's helped you in your career or do you feel like you could have done it in an easier way or do you feel like there's value to that, to that grind? You know, it's hard to say, no, I, you know, I regret doing it because, you know, it was a long, as you say, it was a long slog. Um, and, you know, at the time, you know, as someone out of college, you know, short, or, you know, shortly out of college, yeah. what I knew was school. And I always liked school. So, so to me, it was like, okay, I'm going back to do something that I you know, was, was basically what I had done for my entire life, except for that year or so and some summers, right? So, you know, the, the reality of it, you know, I could, you could, it didn't set in probably, you know, exactly, you know, what that entailed. You know, I knew it kind of was, theoretically. But. Was there something about working in investment banking um, specifically that kind of made you feel like, eh, this is not for me? Or was it more of just like a call? You felt like there was, like going back to school was a good place to be given where the economy was and stuff like that. Like what was it, I guess, what the impetus you said, you kind of felt like you need something more tangible, but I'm just curious your experience in banking. Was it something that you like, looked upon fondly or like you just despised what was the yeah so honestly now i look upon it fondly yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh you know i think it was a very good experience um you know I, I remember going out and you know meeting with a fortune 500 ceo and it was um the, the managing director and, and myself and we were presenting something which if you asked me to explain today maybe even then i would have trouble doing yeah. some very complex you know financial strategy but that was, that was, you know, the kind of thing. And there were other times just sitting in a meeting with you know, pretty senior folks and having my work being displayed and having real, you know, as a 23 year old, I guess at the time, 23 mm -hmm. year old, that, that I liked. And I liked, um, you know, the fact that you very quickly, uh, you know, you worked on a number of different projects and very quickly had to get up to speed. And, and I think the skill set I learned was very helpful. I think as I, so I, I looked at it as more, it was not what I thought I wanted to be doing Mm -hmm. Long to longer term. I mean, I think, you know, if I could have stopped time, maybe that would have been nice to just, you know, maybe do, the, you know, at least a couple of years of it. Um, you know, medicine, you could say it was at a calling, you know, I didn't, I think it was something that I thought would be a more satisfying career for myself. Um, and going back to your prior question, you know, I think that, you know, what I do today, you know, I could I do it without a medical degree? Sure. But, you know, I think the experiences I've, I've had have actually been very helpful. I don't think you should go to medical school just to go so you can be a healthcare investor. I think if that's what you end up wanting to do, that's great. But there are faster and cheaper ways to do it. Um, and I think if you want to practice medicine, which was my intention, you know, when I made the move, then going to medical school is great. But I, I think the skill sets that I've learned through these different experiences actually positioned me well for the, the work that I do today. So you went to a liberal arts college, Amherst. I went to Williams. So I probably had a similar experience. Were you kind of uh, thrown to the wolves when you started banking? Or did, did you feel like the training program got you up to speed? Or were you still just like working crazy long hours trying to figure out what was going on when you first started? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, I had the summer as well. So, you know, at least you know, and it was in the That's same true. firm. So, so got, you know, a bit of the culture and the modeling. I thought the training was, was very helpful. Um, I actually, I enjoy, you know, I like school, so yeah. <laughs> I like, I like the training and, um, uh, it, it was, you know, it was helpful, but you know, nothing is the same as the on the job, uh, you know, putting you into it. And, um, you know, it was, was working long hours certainly. And, and actually at the end of training, I was working long hours cause they took the summers and, and, and staffed them up, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I would say that the, um, the 
you know, I definitely was working long hours, but I, I think at least, and again, my, my, my knowledge of, you know, in it being an investment bank analyst is, is obviously dated. It's, you know, we're, we're what, you know, 18, 18 years. years since I left yeah. banking or so almost 18 years. So it's world has changed, but it's not crazy, crazy, crazy all the time. I, you know, I, that's my vision of what sales and trading is, but it's mm -hmm. a shorter day. You know, yeah. banking is you kind of it worked well. You know, I'm not a I'm not an early riser, and I don't like to go to bed <laughs> early, so I go to bed late. So it worked out well. It was everything was maybe stayed up a little later than I would ideally have liked to, but kind of you know it's not as it, it, you sort of go in, and a lot of the work actually happens kind of after normal business hours. But mm -hmm. there's downtime. There's time to go have dinner with your you know, often in the conference room, but dinner with your colleagues and, um, you know, so so it was long hours but it, it comes in spurts i would say so that's fair i think that's still the case theory. yeah, I still, yeah. That's, that's the same thing as it is today. <laughs> how do you compare your 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 hours in as an analyst to kind of your your darkest days as a resident or a, <laughs> or med school would you say it's similar or how would you compare it, the two it's funny it you know when i when i was leaving um banking and, and you know, I think I hopefully, I think I left on, you know, good terms, good relationships. You know, I tried to be very open and communicative about my decision process and all that. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, folks, I think maybe it was a VP or, or so said to me, so you like the long hours, but you don't like the money. Uh, <laughs> and that probably sums it up, uh, um, probably sums it up right. You know, I, I'd say that. Ouch, I ouch. Yeah, I know, it's true. Um, Although, um, you know, I guess I, now I talk to bankers like, well, bankers don't get paid anymore. I still think they do pretty well. Um, I, I think, honestly, I worked more hours if you count the hours in, in banking than in medicine. The residence hour, resident hours are actually capped. It's scheduled. I think that's the big difference. So, so investment banking and similar client service fields, and I did consulting for a while too, mm -hmm. um, it, it's... A, and banking a is a bit unpredictable. You're responding to a client. You're on call. So yeah, you're always. Call. And medicine in residency is you know when you, you might be on call, but you know when you're on call. You know when you're not on call. I, you know, I was working shifts if I was in the ER. Mm -hmm. And you kind of know when you're working, you know when you're not. Now, you're, you're going to be working overnights. I mean, yeah, you'll pull an all-nighter probably as, a, as an investment banking analyst. But you're going to be scheduled to work overnights in medicine. So it's, it's different, but I felt like you, you kind of knew when you were there and when not with banking, you can be all set to do something and then so, but, uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about the the sacrifice that you had to make because you didn't just go straight to medical school. You had to do some pre med, it looks like. That's right. So you had to do two years of pre med before you were even ready for medical school. That's right. So is that yeah. typical or is it just because you were an econ major at, at Exactly. Yeah. So so look, th there are people who so in my, in my medical school class, there were folks who did, you know, finance or consulting, but they were pre-med. And so, you know, maybe they were working in healthcare investment banking or something and wanted that experience, but then decided, you know, then wanted to go to med school. And those folks wouldn't need to do that. But I was not pre-med in college. I took some math and some... I so my, your, your path was even longer then. It was very long. Yeah. So I basically went... Almost through, eight years. <laughs> yeah <laughs> basically i did well yeah i did um because you did the mda of, yeah 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 two years of of, of pre-med coursework so it's like it's basically you know college without the fun because mm -hmm. you're just doing the coursework but you know it also affords you you know you're only taking pre-med classes so then you volunteer in a hospital you work do research you kind of do as i said kind of the things you have to do to to get into medical school and also for me just to kind of help solidify the decision that medical school is the right decision, um, you know, doing all the due diligence you can do before you're in it. Mm -hmm. um, so I did two years of that and then I actually applied. So did you know, like, did you know you were going to go MBA as well? Was that always, I thought career? about it. I mean, I thought it was, and when I got into, um, uh, to Penn, they have a great program for that. And I actually had a mentor who had done that program who I was working for in that year when I was applying. And so, you know, I, I, you, you don't apply until you're in medical school, but I, you know, it's definitely a, a, a possibility for me because, because I always had that interest in the, in sort of the, the health systems and the health economics and business. So, um, it was a, you know, I'm happy I did that. Uh, and the, yeah, so it's a long road. Some post back programs, which are those pre-med programs are just a year of coursework, a full calendar year, and then you apply. Sometimes there are these linkage programs, but kind of do it the traditional way do your pre-med classes, then you're effectively like a senior in college. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, my pre-med 
friends did all their work by junior year, took the MCAT, applied, but they were in college still, and then had the year. You know, I, so I ended up for that year was working, and I think I took a few classes, but uh, that's kind of the, the path. So it's long, and so that was three years or two years of coursework, the year, and then I did uh, the the joint degree program in, in five years. So it's yeah, it's a long long path. So when you're when you're getting your um, when you're in school in medical school, the first when do you have to kind of apply for the MBA program? So every every school is a bit different. Mm -hmm. um, the typically you do three years of so just to back into it, you typically do three years of medical school, mm -hmm. then a year of business school, and then that last year it's a semester each. And if you know anything about medical school or business school, the last year of each of those schools is is uh, not particularly um, academically challenging. So there you're able to shorten those, um, and so. I think I applied my second year and then deferred for a year because it, it gives you an extra chance if you didn't get in the first year. But you either apply your second, typically your second or your third year okay. to then go after your third year. Some schools you actually may apply concurrently or before you get, but typically you'll be probably at least do your first year of medical school and then apply. What percentage of like MD, MBAs do you think at the top schools end up not practicing medicine? So my year was, uh, we had six joint degree. There were other MDs in, mm -hmm. the, in the business school program, but of the ones we were kind of doing the dual degree, yep. there were six of us. Um, two did not do any training after. Um, and then I now don't practice, but the other three um, always practice. So, you know, it's, you know, 50-50 is not that, I don't think that's that atypical. If I look at the cl other classes, um, you know, I think that maybe the class behind me, there were a couple people who are not. Pre so it's, you know, a, a, in a half dozen, you know, maybe it's, you know, 50 to 70, 20 to 30 percent, 20 to 50 percent, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere something like that. that. Okay. Fair. Just curious. And so when did you kind of know, hey, I'm not going to practice? Was it as soon as you did an internship with uh, McKinsey? <laughs> were you like, this is my calling? Uh, yeah, <laughs> no. So, yeah, I did my, in so, so I, I did my internship, uh, my you know, summer associate after my MBA year, which I, and, and one thing I always encourage the dual degree students to do is, you know, if you're in business school, take advantage of being in business school. And part of business school is doing a summer internship. Uh, right. I just think that's part of the experience. Some of my classmates didn't do that and you know, it's, it's fine, but I actually really think it was a, regardless of if you're gonna practice medicine, not practice, I think it's just a, I think it's a part of the experience. So I'm happy I did it, but I, part of the reason I did it um, was versus trying to do something very niche was I thought I was gonna practice medicine. So doing a consulting internship at a big firm was gonna give me nice exposure, it was an established program. I was gonna you know, learn a little bit on the method for a few months, get on a project and you know, have a good experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I, my intention was to go back and practice medicine. So, you know, it was not, Oh, I did this. This was, I, I had a great experience, uh, at the firm, uh, and, you know, I ended up spending a lot of time there, but I didn't leave that summer saying, Oh, I must be back and, and all of that. So, um, so what, that, led to, what led to that decision? Yeah. Tell me how. Yeah. How so, so it's going to sound very similar to my leaving banking <laughs> okay. where I actually, enjoyed my intern year or my, I signed up for a full residency, but I enjoyed my, my, I only did the first year. So call that the intern year. I enjoyed my, my year. Um, and for me, it was actually a really good capstone to medical school because I actually had real responsibility, um, taking care of patients where med, med school, you, you, you kind of see things, but you're not in it as much. And obviously there was still a hierarchy of senior residents and, and attendings, but I had primary patient care duties. And as an emergency medicine resident, I actually rotated through the whole hospital. So I was delivering babies, I was on the medicine floor, I did a surgical ICU. So I got to actually kind of see the whole system again. So I enjoyed it, and I think with that, but I also realized that um, I wanted to be working on the more macro issues in healthcare. And as much as it would be nice to solve those, you know, those kind of micro you know, patient interaction, to, to solve kind of those, individual patient cases and, and help mm -hmm. patients you know, individually. I, I wanted to be focused more on the, the, the larger healthcare systems issues. And mm -hmm. 
if I could have, we've been through the long path. If I could have stopped time, I would love to, you know, been the doctor for a few years, done that. And yeah, but I just couldn't justify then investing. It would have been then another three years to finish residency. Um, and then pay my dues in the business world. So that's why I ultimately decided to, to leave after that first year. And I thought, go back to McKinsey, that would be kind of like doing an internship or sort of a fellowship or a residency, but in the business world. And even though I had some business experience and you know, resume with some, some other institutions, this would, I thought, give me credibility to go out and you know, work in, in the, uh, you know, the, the business or finance world. Absolutely. I mean, you got the McKinsey name, it's huge. So but just tell me a little bit about the risk you were taking in terms of leaving your residency, is it easy to get back? Let's like, say you were like, no, just kidding. After one year, <laughs> McKinsey actually wanted to finish my residency. Would you have been able to get back? What's the- So, you know, look, I thought about it at times because the grass, as you can tell, the grass is always greener. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think that there are aspects of medicine, clinical medicine that I certainly missed. Mm-hmm. Um, and even to this day, and it's been a while now, um, I guess it's been almost nine years since mm-hmm. I've been out. So, it, you know, I miss it at times. And, and my wife always reminds, she's, we met in medical school. She reminds me, well, I'm not a real doctor. Even, you know, she's like, I, I, I have the MD. I actually have a license, but I'm really, you know, I, I'm not practicing. It's different. So I do miss things at times. You know, if I wanted to go back right away, you know, shortly after, I, I might have been able to. Um, you know, it would have required some, uh, some important, you know, strong negotiation skills and, you know, the right, the right storytelling for why it made sense to go back. I think now it would be, you know, next to impossible. I mean, I could, if I really chose to, right. I'd be starting from this from scratch again. And it just, it would be a very difficult move to make. Okay. Uh, sure. and, and I will say people do go, it's, I did have colleagues who at McKinsey, for example, who did McKinsey for a few years and then actually went to residency. So it's possible. It's, it's, um, it's, no, not it unheard, it's not unheard of, in other words. So you can, you can kind of reset again if, you, if you'd like. They hadn't started residency to begin with, but they had you know, decided to do that for a few years and then go back. And that's, it is possible. I really find the grass is greener syndrome. It's very prevalent. Yes. <laughs> especially, especially, you know, I think a lot of doctors even looking at finance and vice versa, you know, the finance people probably see the doctors and think, oh, so stable, so nice, you know, they can just go in and you're dealing, you're helping people, you have more, yeah. there's a more altruistic sense and the, and the reverse of it is the, uh, the doctors are probably saying, yeah, but, you know, there's a grind here and you guys get, you know, paid a lot more or, or at least used to, depending on the specialty. <laughs> but <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's really fascinating to me, you know, looking at your background where there's a few kind of quick jumps it, uh, it struck me as like, I wonder if there was a little bit of that, but it sounds like you had, you'd given it some good thought. Um, yeah, no, look, I mean, the, the grass is greener syndrome certainly plays a, plays a role in it. You sort of vision in a certain way and you can justify the decisions. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I tried to be very thoughtful about each of those moves because, you know, it is a pivot and there are other people involved, you know, in terms of, you know, I had made commitments to, you know, different places. And I had to be very thoughtful about that and, and, you know, not leave folks in the lurch. And that was very important to me yeah. um, as I was making the moves. But, but I also learned through that process that, you know, if you want to do something else and you, you know, you're thoughtful about it, go do it. I mean, and, and people will be supportive. Um, I was always supported by that. Um, you know, uh, and it's your, it's your life. You need to do what works for you. And I think everyone recognized that. Um, you know, again, just you have to be thoughtful and, you know, and, sure. and communicate, communicate and be open about it because otherwise, you know, then you can put people in a bad position. But mm-hmm. if you don't do that, I think that you'll, you'll find people as I work, you worry a lot about these decisions. And I understand what I did. I worried a lot about some of these decisions and then, you know, and now you sort of, you know, they, they, they fill the spots and everything, everyone moves forward. So. <laughs> so in terms of like your run at McKinsey, it was, it was almost four years. Mm-hmm. And so tell me a little bit about, kind of as you're you're thinking of your next move where you were you thinking potentially stay long term in management consulting or strategy and i assume were you doing strategy work for them or i was yeah so i most of what i was doing at mckinsey particularly my second half sort of as an engagement manager Mm -hmm. was um uh sort of providers so hospital health system strategy on scale growth m a partnerships that kind of work. Um, although I, you know, did a lot of other kinds of things as well. 
Um, so like most people who work at McKinsey or most of the other consulting firms, you only intend to be there two years as you know, they're double that. Uh, and I'm really, I'm really glad I stayed beyond those two years. But again, you know, there, there's, there's no, you know, we have to do what works for you. Why, um, why do you think it was good for you? Yeah. So again, I kind of alluded to it. That second half as an engagement manager, I just, I enjoyed it more. I sort of developed my level, my expertise in that, in that sort of functional and industry area, developed the network within the firm. Um, you know, and I think that, that part of it was nice. It, you know, it just takes a little bit of time to, to do that. Um, and I, I don't think I was going to stay forever at McKinsey. Again, no one, you know, I, I, maybe I would have stayed a little bit longer. The opportunity that I have now came about and I took, I took it. But um, I think that I wanted to get out of McKinsey a few things. Um, and I got most of that out by the time I left. So first, uh, I wanted to learn problem solving. It's a very consultant-esque word, but it's you know, how do you take a problem, a more physician situation and try to break it down. And and I like that. Now, emergency. I did emergency medicine clinically, and and that also has that element to it. So that part was interesting, but I, I wanted to take that piece of it. Two, um, there was sort of that that business communication. So in medicine, it's all about building up to the answer. So you know, here are all the facts, and here let me build that. Like kind of like a lawyer building the facts, and then yep. the client is is, is is not guilty, <laughs> um, or they maybe they and then in 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 the business world, and I'm using that term like, like sounds like a doctor now, using that term very generically. Yeah. Uh, in the business world, it's top-down communication. So we went to the same business school, and there you may just say, "I think it's this," and you may not, you may not back. You know, business school students may, you know, BS a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. In McKinsey, they teach you actually, you know, lead with the answer. The, you know, you you should expand into this market, and these are the reasons why X, Y, and Z. And I, I thought, you know, they. That was actually a very helpful lesson that I learned starting in business school. And I was kind of half joking, you know, starting in business school, but then particularly in, uh, you know, uh, in, in consulting. Mm -hmm. And then the third area, you know, I thought was helpful was just a bit on sort of, you know, managing work streams and people. Now, managing a McKinsey team or any one of these consulting firms teams is one of the easiest things to do because you're working with a lot of motivated people. Um, but, but, you know, kind of managing that, managing my work stream, owning that and learning a bit about, you know, certain areas within healthcare, you know, I wanted to do. Now, I was still learning across those different dimensions when I left, but it was starting to, to flatten out, certainly. And I think the next step for me would have been sort of, you know, selling work or, you know, and, and, and that piece of it, which, you know, has exciting elements to it, but it's not exactly what I wanted to be doing. Yeah. Um, investing, it always intrigued me. Uh, and I actually think the stage of investing in which I we invest um, uh, actually is well suited to someone with a consulting skill set. And so you, how did you come across this opportunity? Was it through a McKinsey alum? Was a, yeah. So, so I actually, my, our, the firm I work at, we, at, the, my two colleagues are, are two, uh, former McKinsey partners. Mm -hmm. Um, we're part of a, a broader, um, kind of asset manager, but, but we met, we manage our fund and there's three of us. Um, and, one of the people who I work with, um, he actually interviewed me for my summer. Uh, and then we worked together on a project. We didn't work together very much, but we worked together on a project um, mm -hmm. you know, at the firm and did some work. And we were in the same office, so we worked together on some office initiatives. Um, so I knew him for years, uh, you know, again, some experience working together and reached out. And kind of that's, the rest is history, they say. And so you've been, it's mostly growth equity? Right. Yeah. So at late stage venture capital growth equity. So it's mm -hmm. um, generally commercial stage companies, but early, early commercial stage companies, um, sometimes earlier. And, you know, so that requires a, a level of analysis that the consulting skill set um, certainly helps with uh, in terms of, you know, what are growth drivers interviewing, you know, doing research, whether it's interviewing experts or, um, and then synthesizing those, those, those findings or doing secondary research, building a, some sort of analytic model. And certainly the banking experience helps from the, what I can remember about building banking models, but different well, kind when of you're, model. Yeah, when you're early stage, it's the, the financial modeling isn't as useful as probably the consulting frameworks that allow you to kind of analyze industries, right? And sub -industries. Exactly. And it, I mean, we're building, you know, revenue, you know, building kind of basic P&L models, um, 
yeah. you know, and, you know, layering and cap table analysis and, you know, and, and returns analysis. So doing that on the diligence side. So a lot of that, those skills kind of pull right from consulting and sort of, you know, analyzing a growth story. And then on the, you know, we, I spent a lot of my time on managing the portfolio. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, a typical investor, it's part-time on fundraising, part-time on sourcing and diligence, part-time on uh, portfolio management, and then sort of administrative work, you know. Across yeah, the of course. Um, and, and portfolio management, um, especially the small firm, the administrative side. Um, but portfolio management, you know, is, is very much what you do, particularly as a senior consultant. We have a little bit more uh, skin in the game now, of course, so we're not just providing recommendations, but we serve it, you know, at a board level. So it's that kind of, you know, using the influence model and, you know, and, and, and thinking about, you know, that kind of influence the management team. So um, a lot of the very similar skill sets, whereas if you're very early stage investing, um, there, there are some other skills you need to bring to bear than maybe less of this. And if you're later, you know, it's much more of the, the financial side of it, which, um, you know, my, my, if I had done banking a long time, be you know, better suited for that side. Fair. So tell me a little bit about just in terms of the transition, would you say when you were at McKinsey before you jumped to the growth that, growth equity did you make it known that you wanted to move how was that or was this it's just like you were approached had you been looking was it something you were kind of yeah i was looking passively um uh yeah look look passively uh and you know kind of because i was working full time uh it was hard to be as structured and deliberate as I would, you know, as sort of my tendency. So, you know, yes, of course, I built a spreadsheet eventually that like categorized the opportunities, but I was looking across a number of different kinds of opportunities from larger company, kind of more in strategy roles, kind of a very typical post consulting experience, startup type companies in variety of roles, um, investing both the public side and the private, you know, private equity and the VC side. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I guess considering, you know, hospital administration as well. So I wasn't exactly sure. That was um, a lot. Yeah. It's a lot of different, that's it's a lot of different, you know, but again, it's more passive. So it was things more inbounds responding to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think investing was always something that, that had really intrigued me. Yeah. How uh, did you, how did you think about that? Cause they're so, they're so different where you in your spreadsheet was obviously you have certain things like location pay and yeah. obvious things, but in terms of how you would rank. Like was the investing job was it, were those given like extra bonus points and the administration job was given less or how would you how were you thinking about it based on like what you had seen? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you know I was trying to find the perfect storm between you know interesting work, um, you know lifestyle, and you know I guess lifestyle and logistics if you can kind of co- you know combine that to get you know all together yeah. and and so yeah I think that investing was. I had an interest in it for a while, you know, um, and so it was definitely intriguing. And I thought, you know, a big company probably will always be there. Maybe not the same opportunity, but that will be there. Investing opportunities are a little bit, can be harder to come by smaller, smaller world. Um, And, you know, I I thought about the public, you know, side and 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 the private side. And certainly was intrigued by the public equity side, the hedge fund side. You know, it's a, remuneration is very nice in that in that world it's in that kind of instant gratification because you see i mean that's also i think very stressful for folks um, yeah. but a lot of it's more on the sort of the biotech life sciences side and it's just you know typically if those of your listeners you know within healthcare investing you know traditionally most of the money has been made is sort of in the the biopharma space um we're in med tech uh, there's a lot more activity there there's actually a lot of excitement around med tech and performance and and which is diagnostics and device. And then I've been a lot of money poured into health IT, some, some not so good, some, some better. And I think starting to be some refinement around what's the investment case within sort of health IT or digital health. But um, I, I never, I, biotech, I, I just, I don't feel like my skill set was as, um, I, be careful what I say because I mean, maybe one day I'll be biotech investing. But uh, <laughs> I, I think it was, it was less of a natural fit for me to do that. Okay. Um, although I certainly, you know, interviewed and got far along. And I think I, at that point I was, uh, uh, probably more of a, uh, you know, pluripotent stem cell than maybe today. Right. Cause I, you know, coming from some of those backgrounds and closer to medical school, closer to, you know, the consulting experience and right. right I, I would, it could have done it, but I think I got less excited about it. Um, you know, med tech, 
is a more, it, it ties more closely to the experience I had, particularly advising hospital systems, because they're the customers of these, of most this, of these yeah. products. And so thinking about reimbursement and clinical value proposition and all that, and just the stage at which it is, just it was more of that clinical side of things um, was helpful. So, um, it, you know, it, it, it sort of became, it was a good opportunity that came across. I think the lifestyle, like I, I think the hard part about consulting is the travel, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Now I like to travel a little bit. It's nice. It's almost like a break. Um, you, you got it back. You got the desire back now that you're exactly. And you know, doing it, you know, once a month or whatever is, is fine. Um, but every week it's hard. And I think that, um, uh, you know, the lifestyle part of it was important. You know, certainly, you know, staying at a big consulting firm, staying at a big bank for a long time is, you know, a, a nice proposition in terms of, uh, the, you know, pay and, and, and there's a, and I'll, I'll use the word prestige, um, not in any sort of elitist manner. And I mean this, I mean, just in terms of sort of what the, um, big name places afford in terms of opportunities, just the opportunities to serve different kinds of clients, opportunities just to sort of, you know, you get exposure to things. And I think, you know, there's that piece of being in a large institution and especially as you grow with it, that just you know, is, you know, offers a lot of nice benefits. No, um, absolutely. Uh, so that was a trade-off I, you know, I thought through. Are you comfortable sharing kind of the pay? I mean, I think it's pretty standard at McKinsey in terms of what's known. It, did you have to take a pay cut to go buy side? Uh, no, uh, no, I basically stayed about whole, but the, the increases are not the same. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. It's not like you're jumping to partner in a few years. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just it a couple you know, of fun cycles probably to start getting kicked. There's off. obviously a lot, of, you know, there's upside in this world, but the, um, you know, in, in, in the professional services world, there are, you know, large increases every year. And so mm -hmm. that's why, that's another reason I think a lot of people sort of leave at the engagement manager level yeah. or, or senior associate because there's sort of less of that gap. Yeah. Fair. Anything before we call it, anything you'd kind of look back at your, your career or your, your academic, both academic and or professional that you would kind of give yourself advice you know, or the younger or the younger listeners kind of anything just looking yeah, back. I, look, I, I think there's, I think it's, it is, you, you, you need to do what you enjoy doing. Um, there's, I know a lot of pressure to sort of follow the path of least resistance, uh, which is easier said than done, right? You know, going to work at marquee institutions is not so easy, right? But, you know, it, and I, you know, look back and I, I don't want to take that for granted. I mean, I worked at some amazing institutions and, um, and had good experiences and met great people there. Um, and it's hard to get those jobs, but in, you know, those places often come to campus, um, throw it in. And so, you know, it's, it, it in some ways, it's, it's a path of least resistance. It also can create a lot of undue stress because you kind of you get in this herd mentality. And I think I would just encourage folks to, you know, do what you want to do. There are, there are lots of ways to make a living. There are lots of ways to live comfortably and, and um, you know, not just one path. And if you are on one path and you want to choose another path, it's okay. Your life, life is, life is long, hopefully. And, yeah. uh, uh, you know, it's, it's totally okay. You know, that's it. On the other hand, I will just say, you know, don't just jump from place to place. I mean, I think, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I can look back, do I, maybe I wish I stuck with something a little longer at times. I think now it's, you know, things have settled down and I'm really happy for the experiences I've had, but I think there's value to spending time in a place and actually getting a lot of good experience and growing and, and, and doing that. But, you know, I think feel no hesitation if you it's not what you want to do as long as you're thoughtful about it to think about making a move. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I think a lot of people, you know, feel like if they're not on the certain path, the stress starts building, and people don't realize how many, especially MBAs, how many times they reset in their yeah. <laughs> in their career. And so, don't be afraid to reset if you're not kind of you're not happy, not fulfilled. Just try to avoid the grass is greener. Exactly. exactly. And really, <laughs> really. At least go to business school for that. Because part of the reason for business school, I mean, there's, there's a number of reasons for it, but part of the reason is to actually think through career changing and it's a great use of business school, honestly. Um, so, but yeah, the, the grass is greener syndrome can be detrimental. A little bit of it's okay. Do some explorations. It can actually help you feel more satisfied in your current job. Mm -hmm. um, and I've gotten advice there. It's like every... I try to not to do every six months because I had the problem before, but you know, yeah. call it every year or whatever, you know, on a regular basis, 
to go and reassess and even look. It's, it's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, one, you may find something really interesting, but it can actually help reaffirm what you're doing. Um, and so you don't get stuck in a rut. And I've, I've definitely heard that advice from, from other folks, and I've you know, taken it to heart at times as well. That's great. I think we'll leave it at that. Adam, thank you so much for taking the time today. I appreciate it. Thanks for everything you're doing with uh, WSL. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks to you, my listeners at Wall Street Oasis. If you have any suggestions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to send them my way, Patrick at WallStreetOasis.com. Until next time.